Grace and peace to each of you this morning, and we welcome all of you to the service of worship. We invite everyone to sign the friendship register, and once you've signed it, please pass it to those seated next to you, that we may have record of everyone's attendance. You'll note that with the small insert in the bulletin, that today, immediately after our worship service, there will be a lunch prepared, it's already been prepared, uh, the bocce tournament will follow that at LPDA. So plan on coming over. They have food for many people. Um, I was in the kitchen with them yesterday morning and we prepared uh, a wonderful lunch for you all. Uh, this is a fundraiser for Malawi Ministries and uh, Barbie Howman will be going with a team from our presbytery in May, and so this will be an opportunity for us to enhance the ministry of, in the pediatric hospital there, particularly for uh, a number of children who have been orphaned because of AIDS in Africa, and this will continue in service to them as well as to the many programs that are offered there. This evening there will be a session meeting at 6 p.m., and Apologies if any of you showed up, I know Chuck did, uh, for the community of men gathering this past Thursday. We decided midweek to re reschedule that because it was poorly advertised. And so it will be March 28th, this Thursday, 4 to 6 p.m. The community of men will gather at the winery. Um, encourage you to bring your snacks and uh, your conversations and we'll share with each other. The next Sunday, there will be a congregational meeting after both services. If you remember last week, we did have a congregational meeting, and it was a short one. This will be even shorter, and the reason being is that uh, there was one name that we did not have last week to include in our list, and that is Janine Burris, who is representing the Missions Committee. She will be serving on the nominating committee, but we as a congregation need to give our assent to that. Now, I know that's not a very controversial topic, so it's a yes or no vote. And we will have that immediately before the benediction next week, and that will take 30 seconds at the most. There is a yellow insert in your bulletin this morning about Holy Week at Easter services, and just a word about that. We were told within the last year or so that uh, we were coming to the end of an era of uh, hearing our children involved in the Holy Week services. Of this I'm talking about children from the larger community and the school system. So this year for the first time we will not be hearing children involved in our worship leadership, although there is the possibility of New Dimension School providing um, some music from their youth in uh, their choir. So we're going to hear different uh, musical leaders who are going to be sharing from their own choirs to the, the, the churches that are involved in this. But that service will continue to be 12 to 12.30, Monday through Friday of Holy Week. Now let us prepare our hearts for the worship of God.
O oh God, we seek you, and our souls thirst for you. Our flesh thanks the Lord, as in the dry and weary land. O oh God, your steadfast love is better than life itself. Friends, this saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel, for in Jesus Christ we are all forgiven. Amen. <coughs> Thank you. 
so today, here we're going to learn about making wise choices. Yes, wise choices. So if any of y'all give me an example of a wise choice that y'all maybe made this week? Yes, your name is Ollie. Ollie, what kind of wise choices did you make this week? Yeah, PJ Mask. Yeah. Hi, anybody else? Yes, Princesses. Princesses? What about princesses? Uh, they just make wise choices. Uh, They're beautiful. Yeah. That's right. Last one. Superman. 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 He makes wise choices to save people, huh? Oh, no, you already have your turn. Hang on. Yeah. Yesterday, I made a not so wise choice. I know. I know, bud. Alright, come here. That's it, come here. Alright, let's give y'all an example. Say, for instance, y'all are going to go over to somebody's house. Say, for, for lunch. Or All right, so you're going to go over to somebody's house for lunch or for dinner. And say one of your options was candy and your other option was vegetables. Did y'all make the wise choice and which one would y'all make? Vegetables. Vegetables? Candy. 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 You pick candy now, too? I, I choose candy. Okay. I choose candy and vegetables. Vegetables. See, this is making wise choices. Candy is the good, fun choice. Candy tastes good. But the vegetables are the wise and healthy choice because that's what you need to grow big and strong and to, you know, to help you out later on in life. Yeah? Okay. Well, the sound vegetable, I got carrots. Carrots? There you go. So we, we got carrots in there. So. so just remember, as you're out in the world this week, and next week, and later on in life, you're always going to have to make hard choices. Sometimes a hard choice is the wise choice. Okay? All right, let's pray. Dear God, watch over these children as they go out in the world. Please give them the knowledge and the wisdom to make good choices. And we pray. Amen. Amen.
morning include both uh, concerns of sorrows and, and health, but also joys. Jerry Wilkerson uh, will be going to chap has gone to Chapel Hill for a workup treatment after uh, some problems with his heart this week. They're actually evaluating whether he needs a heart valve transplant. Uh, so we um, or replacement. So we pray for Jerry in his uh, hospitalization there, and I think Chapel Hill will also be addressing some other medical issues that he has. We learned this week that Laura Martinot's daughter-in-law uh, suffered from a stroke after a blood clot, uh, probably resulting from surgery that happened uh, some days ago. She is just 40 years old, um, so we keep Laura's daughter-in-law in our prayer. John Bowles is uh, continually having uh, some resulting uh, problems resulting from prostate cancer surgery, so we lift him up. And then I want to lift up those that are battling with cancer in our community or are related to our community. Spotswood Neal, Paige Brinkley, Marie Wood, Leslie Martin, Curtis Foshi, Marcia Parsons. And so we keep them in our prayers and any others that are battling cancer. I thought it'd be good for us to remember our oldest member in this congregation, Enos Duran. Uh, who is 99 years old now, and we keep her in our prayers. She is living uh, in the Mills River area of North Carolina. Last week, I shared with you uh, that two women died after a bus accident. The details that I've gotten since then was that the bus traveled under a low-hanging electrical wire, and so the people that were in that bus were electrocuted. Um, but one woman who was in that bus did survive uh, that we know of, and she was also a member of our sister Presbyterian and a leader in the microloan program there. Uh, a prayer of joy, and that Bryce and Kara Hudson have uh, the birth of a baby girl, uh, Quinn Pierce Hudson, seven pounds, 14 ounces, mom and baby are doing fine, and Nancy and Jean Tucker are the grandparents. Uh, Joan and Ben Lawrence were listed as friends of Rita Spivey. Ben was diagnosed just last week with stage four lymphoma, um, so we keep him in our prayers as he and his family go through uh, a massive amount of, of chemotherapy right now to, to try to save his life. Are there others that you all know of that we should lift up? Yes, Linda. Wow. Jeff Harvey has gone back into the hospital. Um, he's been battling with uh, a series now of a, a few times of having infection in his lungs. It is not the cancer that was the initial cause of concern for Jeff, but they're unable to find a, a medication that will address this, so he's back in the hospital with that. Anyone else? Let's turn to God in prayer. We are here this morning, O oh God, because of our desire to worship. The desire that you have instilled in each of our hearts to be closer to you. And the season of Lent draws us closer into your spirit's tether closer into an understanding of your calling and your direction in our lives, and it calls us to change. It causes us to grow, to become more Christ-like in our own lives, to examine ourselves and find our faults, but also to relish and celebrate the gift of grace, which is ours in Christ Jesus. And so on this morning, as we lift up members of this community of faith, some who are going through times of surgery or anticipating surgery for heart adjustments in their lives and are in need of your grace and healing strength, others going through the need for healing strength for chemotherapy and the challenge of cancer in their lives, 
and still others, O oh God, that we have lifted that are grieving. And we remember our sister church communities and the microloan program that has just lost two of its leaders in Guatemala. And we lift before you your desire for their wholeness and particularly the families and the children that both of those women left behind. We ask that you sustain them with your strength and guide those families to wholeness. We pray, Lord, also for those who are struggling with illness and are back in the hospital again and ask your blessing to be with Jeff. Guide and strengthen all who call on you, O Lord. We celebrate the relationship that we have in Christ with our sister church in Guatemala. We celebrate the relationship we have with the hospital of Nakomi in Malawi and the opportunity that we have today to join together in fellowship around a meal and a bocce game to celebrate the ministry that's going there. Guide and direct us, Lord, for we seek that which we cannot provide ourselves, a grace, a healing, a peace that the world cannot provide. And we ask that you will direct us so that we live by faith in confidence and witnessing to that which is our deepest desire and hope, the reign of your eternal love in this world. For we offer this prayer in the name Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, choir. That's one of my favorite anthems. It certainly fits well with what we're focusing on in Scripture today. As we prepare to hear God's word, let us turn to God first in prayer. Open us, for oftentimes we are crusty and ill-tempered and struggle with a soft heart. So open us, that we may hear your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. From Luke 13. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this particular way, that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. For those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse off offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you all will perish just as they did. Then he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. For he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of the Lord. Now, unquestionably, this is one of those texts that upon the first and even upon the second reading, we end up with more questions than we do answers for it. What does it mean that Pilate mingled the blood of the Galileans with their sacrifices? What's this thing about a tower falling on people? Eighteen of them died. And what point is Jesus trying to make with a fig tree? Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor of the region, and he exercised military control over the Jews. Increasingly, from the mid-20s AD until the time of Jesus, around the early 30s, The Jews had rioted periodically against the Roman overseers when they gathered in large numbers to observe Passover. The economic and the religious persecution that they experienced under Roman rule was keenly felt at the time of Passover. And the theme of Passover, God delivering God's people, was reenacted every year at this time, and they recognized they wanted deliverance from the Romans. So they sought God's deliverance, and their reaction oftentimes was to be very uh, boisterous and, and even to offend the Romans and cause great trouble for them in Jerusalem. Possibly it is this reason why the Galileans, who could have been zealots from Galilee and came to Jerusalem for the Passover and rioted, might be the reason why they were killed. And then, what is the reference to the Tower of Siloam all about? You see, the Pool of Siloam is in Jerusalem. It is a pool that a lot of people would come to cleanse themselves before going to worship. And so there was a tower built beside the pool, maybe an observation tower. But for some reason, that tower fell, killing 18 individuals. Now, was that a construction accident? We don't know. Was it the fact that they were all leaning on the tower? And we don't know. But that's irrelevant because it is the reaction that is the most important thing. And the reaction that the Jews had as they were observing the fact that other people had been killed by these events. And that's what Jesus is upset about. 
because the reaction appears to be that the Jews were saying, you know, those people, they're the ones that did these things. God was punishing them. And so Jesus is upset at the fact of what we call self-righteous anger or putting the blame on somebody for a tragedy to happen in their lives. And that's not uncommon for us. We, we recognize that. We've seen it. They must have done something to deserve the wrath of God, surely. Now, anger by itself is not very palatable for us, but when it's self-righteous anger, hey, we like that. And we all have engaged in it at some point or another. We know folks who engage in judging others. And we look at our neighbor and think, you know, if you would help yourself. Or we say, you reap what you sow, or God must have been punishing you for some sin you committed, and that's why this terrible tragedy happened to you. If emotions were food, then self-righteous anger would be like a comfort food. Think your favorite macaroni and cheese dish or something else that you enjoy having. It goes down really well. And we oftentimes look for seconds when we indulge in self-righteous anger or judgment. It fills us with a feeling of superiority. People used to remind themselves that they are the good guys and somebody else has to be the bad guy. I saw this past week a story of a mother of a child who had been immunized for the flu. And this child tragically died of the flu by a strain of flu that the child wasn't vaccinated for. But the anti-immunization parents in this country saw this woman's Facebook online asking for support and ended up doing this. You're a terrible mother. You killed your child. You deserve what you got. <clears throat> now that's about as bad about it. Is about as bad as it gets. Dozens of comments that are deplorable. A mother asking for compassion, getting judgment, and self-righteous anger. Sometimes we use self-righteous anger to tell ourselves, we're not like them. We're better than that. We want to set ourselves apart. Very often times, self-righteous anger is used to justify a tragedy that happened to someone else, just like in this illustration. And that's the very issue that Jesus is wrestling with in Jerusalem. Self-righteous anger directed towards victims and their families of tragedies. That's what he's railing against. No, he said, but unless you repent of your self-righteousness, now that phrase isn't used, but that's what's implied, you will all perish as they did. And it isn't just on an individual level that we often sit in judgment and falsely accuse others as being unworthy of fair treatment. It's easy to be critical of people we don't know, to assume, however, in some ways that they are inferior to us, not as skillful or talented, not as morally developed, not as well-educated. We do this with our own neighbors people we know, and we certainly do it with people we don't know. They're the poor. They don't even have a high school diploma. And when they're strangers, they are the they. We're trying to define ourselves as the insiders and them as the outsiders. This is what Jesus is challenging his audience to consider when he says, unless you repent, you will perish as they did. Unless you see your neighbor as someone equal to yourself and worthy of care, worthy of a relationship, then you yourself will be judged by the very God whom you have accused of 
condemning your neighbor. And there's the rub for us. Jesus warns us against self-righteous judgment. At this point in the scripture passage, Jesus shifts his focus on the parable of a barren fig tree. And that's the third major question that arises out of this text for us. What is this connection between self-righteousness and a barren tree? This particular tree had been growing for three years but failed to produce any fruit. The owner of the land indi in indicated it was time to destroy that tree. Get it out of here. It's taking up invaluable space and we should be growing crops of some sort figs or something else. The parable proclaims urgency. Do it now. The purpose of a fig tree is to produce fruit and it has failed to do so. There should be a more productive plant in its place. But this parable also urges patience. Patience for a tree and a redirection of our efforts to apply fertilizer one more year, to prune it back, to give it another chance. Isn't that what we all need, another chance? So how does this whole passage involving self-righteous indignation and a barren fruit tree fit together? Rather than judging others as being inferior and assuming God has punished them, or that they are unworthy of being perceived as our equal. We're cautioned to do something different, to bear fruit. Perhaps fruit of compassion, fruit of kindness, fruit that will help encourage and lift up. I want to share with you how our presbytery has been involved in bearing fruits of compassion. For one of the most troubling issues to face our economy or our society today. Since 2003, I have visited Guatemala 11 times as a pastor and educator. Currently, I'm serving as a chair of our partnership committee, and I oversee our involvement with two Guatemala presbyteries, including five particular areas of ministry. Our work includes church-to-church -church partnership, and we have about 30-plus churches in this presbytery that are engaged in a sister church relationship. And that means that we are in partnership as we pray this morning, as we remember the Guatemalans. We pray, and we are in partnership looking for God's direction and guidance to lead both churches that are in partnership with each other. Another area that we are involved in with our sister churches is educational programming. Our scholarships that we send down each year provide a year of education for a first through fifth grader. And portions of that scholarship are used for those who are beyond the fifth grade and who show potential and can be good leaders in their own community. And we encourage that by underwriting their continued growth and development, even into college. Our work also includes a microloan program, projects that offer women an opportunity to give, have the chance for them to give back to society giving them a mere hundred dollars in which they invest in their own business. The payback rate on that loan is 99%. And these women are able to provide the basics of food and clothing for their children, otherwise they'd be destitute without it. It's a great investment. The microloans continue, and we've now even entered a second phase of more loan to some of those individuals who show great promise and provide great leadership for their community, employing other people. And finally, through the work for men designed to address domestic violence that we do down there with the curriculum that I wrote, we are seeing churches and societies communities down there being transformed 
by the investments that we are making. My personal relationship in Christ with many of the brothers and sisters there is deep. It's 16 years now in the making. And we have talked for years about poverty and violence. I've heard a number of the stories of desperation, either of those individuals or of their neighbors. Some are fleeing from gang violence, others from extreme poverty. I didn't realize till several years ago that many of them work 10 to 12 hours a day for approximately a dollar a day. Now you cannot feed a family on a dollar a day and so oftentimes children and adults are working from the time they get out of the fifth grade they're already in the labor force working so that their family can survive. In response to these conditions the Presbyterian of Western North Carolina has been working side by side with Guatemalans now for the past 25 years to provide them with the resources to develop safer and healthier, more prosperous living conditions in their own communities. Essentially, we're striving as Presbyterians to create a better life for them in Guatemala. Granted, the problems that exist in these countries are great, and they do require a multi-layered approach in each of the Central American nations. And there are those who end up on our border seeking respite from despair or violence, coming to build a better life. But so much of the rhetoric we hear tries to paint them all as being terrorist or crime ridden. And that's not the case, not for the majority. Now please hear me. As a nation, we most certainly need border security, no question. But categorizing them all as being a violent threat to our nation is inaccurate. As Presbyterians, we believe our response requires more than moral superiority or self-righteous anger. Rather, we believe we need to help our Guatemalan Presbyterian brothers and sisters address the underlying challenges in their own communities to give them reasons to stay. I believe it'll take more than border security for us to resolve this issue in our society. And I am so grateful that I've been part of a presbytery now for 18 years that is looking for ways to resolve issues there to strengthen the lives there so that they don't feel they have a need to come to our borders. What would happen if our country, what would happen if others in our nation were to do the same? We as Presbyterians are bearing fruit, fruit of compassion, fruit of understanding, fruit of listening, fruit of being a part of a community with neighbors whom we, many of you all don't know, but others of us do. And we're building hope in Guatemala by accompanying them through their lives, bearing fruits of righteousness and justice for our friends and neighbors. In so doing, we bear witness to the compassion and support offered to our Waldensian forebears at numerous points along the many centuries struggle when our Waldensian forebears were themselves judged as being unworthy, as heretics, as hated people, a blight to their societies. And someone reached out and helped along the way. We of all people know that the road to God's justice is oftentimes long and full of setbacks and requires patience and compassion and forgiveness along with determination and commitment on our part. To do so is to make wise choices, to follow Jesus on the road to Lent, to hear the call to become part of the solution and not add to the problem. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
invite you to stand and join with me now. The affirmation of faith comes today from Isaiah, the 55th chapter. It helps us to remember that all of us, all of us are hungry and thirsty for God's grace. Let us join together. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I have said it. Please be seated. With what shall we come before the Lord? A desire for justice, a desire for righteousness, and a willing to work for those things, and to be of peace and joy in ourselves, in humility. This is what we offer to God in response. <laughs> of the building of your kingdom in this world, for we ask it in Jesus' holy name.
service and encourage all of you to attend. Now may the grace, the power, and peace of our risen Lord guide us into this world as agents of hope, as reconcilers, as people who put aside judgment that we may live in grace and bring grace to others. In the name of our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.